This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of the podcast, where I'm chatting with writer Kendra Wilson. Kendra has written a vast amount about gardening, but I was particularly interested in speaking to her about her book, Garden for the Senses. Engaging all your senses can lead to a deeper connection with the landscape, and it can be an unusual and transformative experience. I wanted to find out how we can all learn to better use our senses, and firstly, what prompted Kendra to write the book? The publisher came to me and suggested it, and I was very unwilling to do a book, um, because I've already done eight or something. Good experiences, but I wasn't looking to do a book, but when it was Chris Young, who was formerly of the RHS, and he was describing the idea that senses would also bring in a lot of uh, cultural and historical angles. It wasn't just a guidebook for how to plant things. I'm not very good at how to garden writing. I don't find it very interesting. So when he presented this wider picture, my ears pricked up. And I suddenly found that I was doing it before I'd even agreed to do it. <laughs> and did you find that it was really interesting to research the cultural and historical references? Yeah. And I mean, there was something that he also mentioned in his brief, which was that it would be a bit scientific. And I completely ignored that part because I'm not at all scientific. And actually, that was really interesting. It was absolute torture doing the research, but discovering a bit more about the way insects see flowers. I think we all feel we vaguely know that bees like yellow and blue flowers, but might not have been aware that their colour spectrum involves ultraviolet light. It's not RGB, but it's ultraviolet and yellow and blue, I think. So when they look at a flower, they see something completely different from what we see. So, for instance, an evening primrose, which is just a yellow blob to us, is actually quite a detailed pattern, a bit more like a carnation, uh, leading them directly to the pollen and the nectar. In the chain of plants and insects, we don't play a part. And that's a very clear example of how plants are designed for insects, not for our pleasure. Yeah, that's a really interesting take on it. Thankfully, we don't have to design, although we do design for bees, we're not designing for them in terms of any flower patterns or anything, because that would just add another layer of complication to what we were trying to achieve. It's difficult enough as it is. Exactly. I did wonder whether catering to the senses can lend another dimension to the garden. I mean, as I say, you would often design maybe for the look of something, but then trying to design in the attraction to the senses, it does add in another dimension. Does it make it really a complicated job to do? What the book made me realise was that as soon as you let go of your conventional ideas of gardening and the idea that there are rules and do's and don'ts, and you become more open-minded, then you see that there's overlaps in everything. So people talk about texture in a garden it sounds very dry and a green garden with texture people like oh no that sounds a bit advanced or technical but if you're looking at the structure or the texture of a leaf then it's also automatically becomes the tactile thing there are some plants which obviously appeal to more than two senses for instance figs Figs have got the fantastic leaves and the texture of the fruit and the smell when you touch the fruit and the unpeeling of it. They appeal to animals. They attract more animals than any other plant. Over a thousand mammals apparently feed off fig, not just mammals, obviously. And and so there's the taste there's the sound because they attract these rustling creatures or birds and there's an awful lot of overlapping so I've just moved to Oxford and have a little yard garden and my objective is to plant for the senses so in each plant I'm going to consider for at least two senses ideally three because it's actually quite easy when you think about it when you start opening your mind to 
the way something feels or potentially sounds in the animals it's drawing in, then there's a lot more going on than just the visuals and the scent. Yeah. You said about your aiming to plant to stimulate at least two senses, preferably three, but you've written the book, you've immersed yourself in this style of gardening, if not practically, certainly in theory. And if someone was coming to this new, would you suggest that they started out by concentrating on one sense or could they go for stimulating all of them or do you think it's more personal choice? I think that thinking about one sense is probably the conventional way of approaching gardening. So people would always think about the looks and they'd think about the way something should look. And a lot of received ideas came into that and snobbery and what's the person next door doing. It's quite boring to look at plants in terms of the way they look because it's not always a natural reaction that you have. So if you see a plant in terms of and now we're looking at planting for pollinators, which is great. People begin to plant things which they might not have thought of as conventionally beautiful, but they're putting it in because it's attracting pollinators. For instance, the Physelia, which is quite a strange looking purple flower. It looks a bit like an Elizabethan coxcomb or something. It's obviously beautiful when you look at it close up. But it doesn't stand out in a crowd. However, if you plant Physelia, you will draw in every kind of bee. It's a green manure, so you can dig it into the ground at the end of the season and it adds nitrogen to the soil. And it's a ground cover. So it's more important now to have ground cover to cover all the soil than it is to have individual beautiful plants or the old fashioned thing of having dahlias tied up with string or bamboo with each plant looking supposedly at its best. Now the visual idea is to have a lot more bounty and it's better for your garden. So then you're thinking of textures and sounds and smells. You just naturally you're thinking about more than one sense. Whereas in the old days, it was a bit more, this is my rose garden, it smells nice. This is my dahlia bed. These are my marigolds all in a row with scorched earth in between. Thank goodness we've moved on from that. We need to go further. Definitely. I am going to put you on the spot a little bit now, I'm afraid, because as I was kind of reading through the book, I thought it'd be really nice if you could think about one good plant that would engage with each of our five senses and why you might recommend that plant in particular, because in the book you do have plant profiles and you pick some really interesting examples. So I thought maybe you could just pull one out for each sense, if you wouldn't mind. Each sense. As I mentioned, fig is a great plant for at least four senses. And I would say this might be not a surprising answer for British listeners, but crab apple would be top of my list. Anything in the rose family is fantastic for bringing in insects and birds. Roses harbour a huge number of creatures like crawling over them like aphids and then they things hovering around and then the birds which eat them. And if you stand underneath an apple tree and just look closely and listen, it's a pretty fascinating experience. But crab apple, I would say, has a slight edge because it's just slightly prettier. Blossom is like pinky, it's that kind of mixture of dark pink to white, you know, mixture of buds and flowers. And then in the autumn when the fruit comes, you've still got last year's old dried fruit if you haven't been too fastidious with it you've got sort of four seasons all in one tree they're a reasonable size they're fantastic to have near a window they're not going to undermine the foundations of your house they're just alive all year round even in winter when it's snowing you'll have field fairs or birds that you never see in your garden that finally make it to your crab apple tree because that's the only thing that's going on at that time of year so it's good to plant the, where the fruit doesn't get eaten immediately other plants for the senses i would say for sight i would go for something weird and wonderful because why not like the white stem bramble or ghost bramble sometimes called when i was a trainee gardener at cottesbrook hall there was a stand of i suppose you call it of ghost bramble 
in the wild garden. And I was just astounded that anyone would want to grow decorative bramble. It was such a bizarre idea. And also pruning it was interesting. But when I've seen it grown really well at Wisley, it's so dramatic and an incredible plant, just crisscrossing, ghostly, kind of fingery shapes, which go really well with the winter colours of cornice or willow when you've got the red or yellow stems behind it. But you need a bit of space for that. It's a dramatic thing, which, you know, it's great if you've got an estate, but you might not have that. So Love Lies Bleeding in Summer is pretty dramatic and incredible in all the different colours. Not just dark red, but it could be bright, bright green or a sort of tawny colour, which almost looks like it's dead, but I think it looks pretty cool. It's a sort of knobbly, yellowy brown flower. But generally, as the name implies, it's a rich red dripping with flowers reach to the ground it's fantastic and also the dwarf conifers i've got a lot of time for because they create so much structure in a garden which is much more interesting i think than box balls and box spirals and yew cones etc those pine needles against fluffy flowers or textural foliage plants look amazing Back in fashion, but they should be beyond fashion, really. Food, I'd say, something to grow. I would always grow the things which need absolutely no attention, like plum trees, apple trees, crab, crab apple. They don't need much attention. Pear. They used to have espalier pears. And yes, you prune them once a year or twice just to tidy them up. But once they're espalier, ideally if there's someone else in my case, they're really quite enjoyable to keep trimming. And the abundance is incredible. But the easiest thing is the alpine strawberries, which provide a good ground cover, and especially around the corners of a garden, like where the wall might hit the ground and the corner, the perpendicular kind of areas. Alpine strawberries to soften it all up around steps. And you can just walk around and eat them, put them in your bowl of yogurt or whatever. And the same with autumn raspberries, which required absolutely no work except to cut the stems down once a year. Easy things, I'd say. Grow easy things and eat them as you go. For scent, I'd always have lilac, the most incredible smell, which for me reminds me of when I was a child. And so therefore it's got that Proustian element, but also it's so intense and overpowering. And I wish I hadn't read somewhere that you're not supposed to cut them and bring them indoors because it's bad luck. Just ignore that. Cut stems, sear them in hot water, in boiling water, and just bring stems indoors of lilac is the most incredible thing. And stems in winter time with winter scented plants like sarcococca, which I can never pronounce, and viburnum, or not necessarily scented, but magnolia, just cut a branch and bring it indoors. Just be generous with roses. Cut long branches, don't just cut a few little buds, just cut the whole, you know, prune it as you go and bring it indoors. Water lilies appeal to several senses because they just invite you to gaze at them and see what comes over and lands on them and then flies away again. If you're frogs in a pond with water lilies, I think that is in itself a whole garden and it appeals to several senses. And for sound, for me, it's mainly about the insects and birds. So you'd want anything in the rose family. In my old garden, which this book is really a homage to my old, very ungardened garden, where I had roses around the windows and doors in that corny but very satisfying way where I had Madame Alpha Carrier around the kitchen window and then I put in one of those suction bird feeders on the window so the birds had lots of shelter and they sit on the branches of the rose and then hop down to the feeder but the rose branches were just full of food as well like various insects including green fly and they were also full of 
Lady Bird. And there was so much life. But just outside of where I stood and washed up, there'd be a blackbird almost staring back at me. Because once they got used to you, they'd keep coming. They didn't mind that you're wandering about inside the house. It's the most fascinating thing. You have to have cover around the windows. But that's also a good distraction from the neighbours. You, you look at the flowers right in front of you instead of the ugly fence in the middle distance. It was interesting, actually, what you said then about the insects being the source of sound, because actually I think what came through from listening to you is that it is almost about the bigger picture of the garden and what exists within it on top of the plants as much as it is about the plants. And I think you also talk about features that can stimulate your senses as well. So the book is really about the whole ecosystem of the garden, isn't it? Yeah. The book is based on my old garden and I used to feel frustrated that I didn't have time to go out and garden it. And also I couldn't ever get the design right, which was the basis of for one of my old books, My Garden is a Car Park and Other Design Dilemmas, which is full of design problems because it had so many problems over how to design it because it was a funny higgledy piggledy country garden which didn't have any shape or it was overlooked it was just weird so at some point I abandoned any idea of making it look like a proper garden and it really fed it for itself and the more I relaxed about it the more happiness it gave us all I think yes we mowed the lawn and my husband grew vegetables and he made about five beds and we had four compost heaps. So it was overseen, it was overlooked, but I certainly wasn't going around doing a lot of digging and pruning and fussing over it. It just gave so much back. And the house next door, which we have very much overlooked, I had a perfect old cottage garden, which had been lived in by an old lady since the 60s. And she wasn't very mobile, but she had somebody come in and trim it sometimes, but it was very much self-perpetuating with perennials and trees. And when the young person moved in, she was freaked out by the idea of having a garden, started pulling things out. It's all this exposed earth. She started putting in more and more paving. She didn't like the fact that the more she pulled out of the old plants, the more weeds came up. And so she was graveling everything. And she kept saying, oh, it's such a lot of work, gardening. <laughs> and... It was quite painful to watch the whole process because um, people don't always like to listen when you say, just leave it alone. They don't really want to hear that. But they do like shopping. So more and more stuff would come in, like decoration. And uh, that's what people like doing, it seems. Buying things and putting them in their garden and just trying to turn it into sort of outdoor living room, which is just so completely opposite to my style. I do think that is a very common complaint. We just buy too much stuff. We don't need all this stuff. It drives me mad. But I think also it's quite easy when you're in a garden to not appreciate it on every level. One of the things that came out of reading the book as well, and it's actually, I think, my final question to you. It is a big one. I'm hoping that you could shed some light. But sometimes we go in the garden, we just look at it. We don't see past the visual. If people want to engage more with their senses when they're in the garden, have you got any techniques that people could use to do that? I think that we need to see our outdoor space as a place to generally relax and try to calm down. And the more you plant for the senses, the more rich the outdoor space will become. And it's actually less easy to ignore the bird song. Like, for instance, robins and blackbirds, so they're worth identifying because they've both got incredible song. But you will have regular blackbirds and regular robins. And when you see them hopping about, then that leads the eye to looking at them. And you can easily just find yourself standing in the garden staring at a robin in a tree making this rather piercing noise as it's singing or you might see some if you're lucky enough to see broken snail shells on the ground and then you identify it with the sound of a song thrush you might have one song thrush that keeps coming back to your garden eating snails and making the most incredible song which is almost like a nightingale it has quite a repertoire of song thrush so these things when you start noticing 
you just slow down because it's actually really enjoyable. I spent a lot of time just standing under my apple tree and I've set a hammock under it and I would just gaze into it because I couldn't believe the amount of life it harbored. If you just stare at a hoverfly, they're hovering next to something and they're intent on it and then they zoom in. And so you're watching the life or the trajectory of a fly and then you see the bird and then you see the, the ladybird larva. It's actually quite entertaining if you will give yourself the time to do that. But once you start gardening for more than one sense, then I think that you find yourself drawn out there more because you're not just designing a garden to be looked at from inside a window. You're consciously planting things which will attract birds and insects and ideally frogs, and therefore more noise. And so the visual will draw you outside, but once you're outside, pretty engaging just you know standing and gaping at your garden if you can find the time to do that and I think that you might get forced into it if you start gardening in this way thank you very much to Kendra and thank you to you for listening I hope you can get out into your garden and engage all your senses speaking of which those of you in the UK have you caught the whiff of autumn in the air I have I leave you now with Dr Ian Bedford, speaking about a very interesting group of butterflies and a curious interspecies relationship. Each year, there's around 60 different butterfly species that could be seen in Britain. And amongst these are seven small, fast-flying species that we call the blues because of their distinctive cerulean wing colours. Britain's blues all belong to a large family of butterflies called the Lysinidae, which comprises of around 6,000 species worldwide. A family from which many members have evolved Mamecophilus associations, which means they interact with ants. Ants who will protect their caterpillars from predators and often care for them inside their nests. But why might ants do this? Well, even after centuries of study, it remains an enigma as to who's manipulating who or whether it's just a true symbiotic partnership. Since the Lysinidae caterpillars seem able to stimulate the ants' caring behaviour using vibrational signals, whilst the ants passively harvest sugary secretions from the caterpillar's body. And as for Britain's blue butterflies, they all appear to have Mamecophilus associations too, with some more blatant than others. But possibly the most fascinating relates to the life and times of our large blue butterfly. First recorded as a British species 200 years ago, the large blue had always remained rare, surviving only in small pockets on grazed heathland across the southwest of England. But during the 20th century, their population started to decline, until eventually in 1979, Britain's large blue was declared extinct. Despite a huge effort to avert this tragic loss, the cause of this butterfly's demise had never been identified, and it remained a mystery until Professor Jeremy Thomas, a student butterfly ecologist at the time, discovered the answer during his research on Dartmoor. He found that the large blue had evolved a unique association with just one species of red ant that collected its young caterpillars from wild thyme then kept them in their nests, where they fed them on the ants' larvae. However, the ants' nests could only survive in locations where heathland grass was maintained short by grazing animals. And so during the post-war years, when myxomatosis decimated the wild rabbit populations, the heathland grass grew taller, the ants' nests died out, and the large blue became extinct. Unfortunately, this discovery came too late to save the last of Britain's large blue butterflies. But by understanding why it had happened, it enabled the re-establishment of large blues using Scandinavian stock to sites across the southwest of England, creating what is now thought to be the largest populations of large blue butterflies to be found anywhere in the world. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation 
or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.